Hi everyone, and welcome to the Nokia Q1 2023 results call. Um, I'm David Mulholland, Head of Investor Relations, and today with me is Pekka Lindmark, our President and CEO, along with Marco Varen, our CFO. Before we get started, a quick disclaimer. During this call, we will be making forward-looking statements regarding our future business and financial performance, and these statements are predictions that involve risks and uncertainties. Actual results may therefore differ materially from the results we currently expect. Factors that could cause such differences can be both external as well as internal operating factors. We have identified such risks in the risk factor section of our annual report on Form 20 app, which is available on our investor relations website. Within today's presentation, references to growth rates will mostly be on a constant currency basis, and margins will be based on our comparable reporting. Please note that our Q1 report and a presentation that accompanies this call are published on our website. The report includes both reported and comparable financial results and reconciliation between the two. In terms of the agenda for today, Pekka will give a quick overview on our financial and strategic progress in the quarter, and then Marco will go into a bit more detail for the key factors impacting our financial performance, along with our outlook for 2023. With that, let me hand over to Pekka. Thank you, David, and good morning, everybody. Q1 has been a busy and exciting quarter for us. We started this year with the unveiling of a renewed corporate strategy and, as you remember, refreshed brand at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. We shared the six pillars of our updated strategy in Q4, which you see on this slide, so I won't go into detail about them again. But uh, in general, in Q1, we have executed well on gaining market share in the CSP space, which is the first pillar. Uh, you can see that very clearly when you look at our growth rates. And uh, we have also seen enterprise, pillar number two, continue to rise as a share of the group sales and uh, was another quarter at close to 10% of the group growing 62%. Regarding pillar three and actively managing our portfolio, there were some actions taken in Q1. We have signed agreements to divest part of our RFS business, and we have sold our vital QIP business. Also, we recently agreed to sell our stake in the joint venture TD Tech, subject to closing conditions. These actions won't significantly impact our financials, but are important proof points of how we are managing the portfolio. Underneath the six pillars are four enablers. Talent, which is about developing future fit talent, Long-term research is important. We believe that sustained technology leadership is a key driver of our success. Digitalization, we are increasing the digitalization of our own operations to increase our own performance and productivity. And finally, brand. The new branding reflects who we are today, a B2B technology innovation leader unleashing the exponential potential of networks. So with that, let's now turn to the financials. We delivered a solid start to 2023 with Q1 net sales growing 9% in constant currency. We saw double digit growth in both network infrastructure and mobile networks, reflecting the ramp up of 5G deployments in India as expected. We also saw growth in CNS, and I will come back to the decline in technologies later. Our comparable operating margin was 8.2%, a decline of 270 basis points year on year which was primarily due to expected greater seasonality in mobile networks profitability, a weaker contribution from Nokia Technologies in the quarter, and a negative impact from venture fund investments. As we look forward, we are starting to see some signs of the economic environment impacting customer spending. However, given the ongoing need to invest in 5G and fiber, we believe this uncertainty is primarily a question of timing. We will maintain our cost discipline to ensure we can successfully navigate this uncertainty, and we remain on track to deliver another year of growth in 2023 with our outlook unchanged. If we now turn to address each of the business groups in more detail. And first, <clears throat> looking at the performance of network infrastructure, we delivered 13% growth year on year in constant currency. Optical networks grew 45% with good engagement for our PSC5 solutions 
and with some benefits from catch-up sales from the supply chain challenges we saw in 2022. IP networks grew 13%, driven by North America, and also a strong performance in enterprise. Our new FP5 based routing products are now shipping, and we accept the gradual transition to the new platform in the coming years. We saw a small decline of 5% in fixed networks against a tough year on year comparison. Weakness in fixed wireless access offset continued robust demand for fiber. Summary networks grew 11% as web scale driven project deployments continued to drive growth. Gross margin expanded 330 basis points as a result of product mix benefits and lower costs in areas such as logistics, which have declined versus last year. Operating margin of 15.3% was up 540 basis points versus last year, reflecting our gross margin expansion, which was only partially offset by higher OPEX. Going forward, Growth rates are expected to slow in the coming quarters as Q1 benefited from some catch-up as supply chains normalized and with comparisons becoming more challenging, but we remain confident in our competitive positioning. I'd also like to highlight the product launch we made in optical networks in Q1. Just before Mobile World Congress, we unveiled PSC6S, Nokia's sixth generation super coherent optical engine for high performance optical networks. With this product PSC 6X, PSC 6S, Nokia brings to market new optical transport capabilities, including the ability to deploy solutions with 1.2 terabits per second per wavelength. And because we are able to connect two, chip, two chips together on a single line card, we can support up to 2.4 terabits per second, which is an unmatched capacity on the market. Uh, we have also set a new benchmark in performance, enabling reach over 2,000 kilometers at 800 gigabits per second. Sustainable network evolution with 60% less power consumption per bit compared to previous generations. We have had great take up of our PSC5 solutions already and we see good potential to continue that momentum with PSC6S. Our interactions with customers have been extremely positive so far. Then turning to the next business group, mobile networks. Also there, it was great to see 13% growth in the first quarter. It was driven as we expected by the ramp up of 5G deployments in India. But we also saw good traction in Europe. Together, these more than more than offset the expected softening in North America sales in the quarter. North America had seen a front-end loaded investment profile in 2022, so this quarter marked the normalization of customer spending and also reflected some inventory depletion. With respect to gross margin, the regional shift had an impact as expected, but disciplined cost control partially offset this at the operating margin level. As we look forward, we expect to see broadly similar trends in the second quarter with continued pressure on gross margin from regional mix before we see this start to progressively improve in the second half of the year. As I mentioned earlier, it's clear that there is some economic uncertainty impacting customer spending plans. In that regard, it is worth noting that if we look globally, excluding China, only about 20% of sites, mobile base station sites, I mean, are currently active for mid-band 5G, which should help illustrate how much investment still needs to be made. And even if we look at some markets like North America, which had invested earlier, mid-band site penetration is still only around 50%. At Mobile World Congress, we also unveiled Habrock, our latest generation of industry-leading airscale radios, which deliver future-ready performance. Habrock has high output power for increased coverage, while its lower power consumption improves energy efficiency by 30%, lowering total cost of ownership. This new generation of radios enables form factor improvements over earlier generations, while the Habrock 64, weighing only 24 kilograms, making them fast and easy to install. 
And of course, they are all powered by our cutting edge reef shark chipset, some of which are based on 5 nanometer technology. These optimized products refine radio performance with ultra fast 5G speeds and capacity where it's needed. And then moving to cloud and network services business. CNS grew by 3% in the quarter, with growth in both core networks and enterprise. Gross margin declined as we saw a shift from software sales to lower margin hardware sales in the quarter, so that was primarily a mixed question. Operating margin was minus 2.6%, resulting from lower gross margin, with some increases in SG&A and R&D expenses as we continue to invest to strengthen leadership, especially in campus wireless. Our rebalancing work in CNS continues, and in the quarter we divested vital QIP, a relatively small IP address management product, which was within CNS. For the full year, we continue to assume a 5 to 5 percent to 8 to 5 percent operating margin, keeping in mind this remains a business with significant seasonality in Q4. Nokia Technologies' net sales declined by 22% in the quarter. On a year-to-year -year basis, there were three factors driving this decline. The fact we no longer benefit from the license that had an option exercised in Q4, lower net sales from a smartphone vendor whose market share meaningfully declined, and finally, lower brand licensing. Excluding these three factors, our licensing income was essentially stable also accounting for the renewed agreement with Samsung. We know there have been many questions around our technologies business in the past year as we navigate the smartphone license renewal cycle. And with this slide, we wanted to give you some more detail on the moving parts. We start from the 1.4 to 1.5 billion run rate we talked about back in Q2 21, before some, before some agreement started expiring. You can see the moving pieces from then to the 1 billion run rate you now see in Q1. The two biggest factors are the deals that are currently in litigation or renewal and the 10-year license, which was signed in 2014, but then saw an option exercised in Q4 2022, which meant all outstanding revenue was recognized for that license. Consequently, this agreement no longer benefits our income statement. There have also been some agreements with smartphone vendors that are no longer active or whose market share has meaningfully declined, which need to be reflected as we go through the renewal cycle. You can also see the benefits we have seen from our progress in growth areas like automotive and consumer electronics. And finally, there is the impact of brand licensing, which was weak in Q1. This brings you to the current 1 billion run rate. We remain confident we will return to the 1.4 to 1.5 billion run rate. The biggest step to getting there is smartphone license renewals. As you know, we are in active litigation on some of those. We remain confident in our position and that we will see a good resolution to these deals. We also continue to see opportunities in the future to continue to expand in our focus growth areas. Looking now at Another one of our focus areas, the enterprise customer segment. In Q1, we saw continued momentum in our enterprise sales with growth of 62%, and it was almost 10% of group, sale, group sales for the second quarter in a row. Growth was particularly strong in web scale, where sales more than doubled in the quarter. Private wireless continued to grow strongly double digit and now has more than 595 customers. Customer engagement also remains positive as we added 73 new enterprise customers in the quarter. And with that, let me hand over to Marco, who will take us through the financials in a bit more detail. Thank you, Pekka, and hello from my side as well. So looking at our net sales performance by region, uh, our 9% constant current growth was fueled by India as expected, with 5G deployments continuing to ramp up for mobile networks in Q1. But also network infrastructure showed strong growth in the region. In Europe, you see that we had a 30% growth, excluding Nokia Technologies, with strong double-digit growth across the other three BGs. 
Elsewhere, we saw growth in both Middle East and Africa and Latin America. These were somewhat offset by North America, which declined 12% overall, driven by mobile networks and partly offset by increases in network infrastructure and cloud and network services. Greatest China and Asia Pacific also declined somewhat, while submarine networks grew by 11%. So in, in summary, quarter one largely played out as we expected, with 5G deployments in India heavily influencing our Q1 top line. Then turning into the operating margin performance in the quarter, and you saw the decline 270 basis points uh, and ended up at 8.2% uh, operating margin. This decline largely reflects the impact of regional and product mix, especially mobile networks and cloud and network services. We did see some benefit uh, from the 9% group net sales growth, which provided some operating leverage. You can also see that the lower overall uh, level of net sales and technologies had a negative impact on operating margin. And finally, our venture fund had a year-on-year -year negative impact of 70 million uh, euros, which is recorded in other operating income and expense. And the low value in, in this quarter of 30 million uh, was evenly split between FX fluctuations and revaluations. And then looking briefly at operating profit performance by business group, without repeating what Beck already said in his remarks, you will see that the strong profit expansion in network infrastructure was somewhat offset by lower profits in cloud and network services and mobile networks. Also, Nokia technologies declined, as we explained, and, and drive profits lower, and also the group common, which is negatively impacted by the Nokia Venture funds, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Then, moving to uh, cash, free cash flow in the quarter was negative 147 million euros, and the main driver of this was a decrease in accounts payable, driven by quarter on quarter decrease in cost of sales within networking capital. Cash was also negatively impacted by cash taxes, capex and restructuring costs. And I'm pleased to see as well that we returned about 190 million as our shareholders through both dividends and share buybacks. This all led to a net cash balance of uh, 4.3 3 billion euros at the end of the quarter. And then if you look at our addressable market, um, we have updated this to show our latest view across business groups. And, and the adjustment we've done is uh, on our view on mobile networks, and we've taken down that from 5% to 4% as we start to see some impact of the economic situation on customer spending. And CNS has also reduced slightly from 4 to 3%, while network infrastructure remains at 4%. And then turning to our outlook for the year, which remains unchanged in constant currency, we did adjust our net sales outlook to reflect latest FX rates, with the range now at 24.6 billion. Uh, to 26.2 billion euros. And we also reiterated our comparable operating margin guidance of between 11.5 to 14%. And notably, we updated two of our outlook assumptions today. The first one is the group common and other operating profit, which is now expected to be negative 350 to 400 million. And this is driven um, by the negative impact that we had from Nokia Venture Funds in quarter one and, um, and how the valuations have developed, developed in venture markets. 
And the second is around our CapEx assumptions. We have increased our expectations for this year to 700 million euros. And finally, uh, a mention of our updated capital management policy, which we announced earlier in quarter one. Nokia's previous target in terms of cash management was to maintain a gross cash position equivalent to at least 30% of net sales. And going forward now, we will target to maintain a net cash position in the range of 10 to 15% of net sales. So change from cross cash to net cash. And this is to ensure that we can continue to invest in the necessary R&D to maintain and further improve our technology leadership, also fund working capital requirements in support of our growth ambitions and to maintain some flexibility and uh, maintain some flexibility for bolt-on acquisitions. And considering the ongoing macro uncertainty, our expected growth and working capital requirements in 2023, along with already announced shareholder returns, we are not imminently planning to take action to align with this target. However, assuming the expected significant improvement in cash generation in 2024, we would then look to start acting to align the net cash position with the long-term target. And this can be done, for example, through increased shareholder returns and or potential bolt-on acquisitions. And with that, I will hand over back to Pekka for a few concluding remarks. Thank you, Marco. If I can just very briefly summarize how we see our Q1 performance before we turn to Q&A. So we had said 2023 would be another year of growth, and we have started the year strongly in that regard with 9% net sales growth. We are executing on both our ambition to gain share in the CSP space and grow enterprise as a percentage of our net sales. As we had said previously, seasonality will be different this year to the last two years, but it is playing out largely as we expected, and we remain on track for our full year targets. Looking forward, there are some signs of the economic outlook impacting some customer spending plans, but if we maintain our cost discipline and execute on our strategy, I believe we are in a strong position to navigate the challenges ahead. And with that, I'll hand it back to David for the Q&A. Thank you, Pekka and Marco, for your remarks. Before we move to the Q&A session, um, I just wanted to highlight it, that we will be hosting our next progress update presentation on the 15th of June, which will be on our network infrastructure business. The event will be in the afternoon in London, and it will be a hybrid event um, for those who aren't able to join in person, um, so it will also be webcast. But with that, let's start the Q&A, and as a courtesy to others in the queue, can you please limit yourself to one question and a brief follow-up? Alice, could you please give the instructions? We will now begin the question and answer session. If you are also viewing the webcast, please remember to mute the audio on your computer before asking your question, as there is a 30-second delay. To ask a question, you may press star and then one on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. I will now hand the call back to Mr. David Moholland. Thanks, Alice. We'll take our first question today from Andrew Gardner from the city. Andrew, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, good morning, Pekka. Good morning, Marco. Um, mine was on uh, just sort of the relationship between technology and your full year guidance. Um, you know, clearly we've had a slow start to the year in technologies, similar to how we did last year, where we were working for some of the license uh, agreements to come through, which of course didn't. The added pressure this year now from Microsoft and from the handset market, um, but it's still incredibly important uh, factor for you with your full year group level guidance. Can you just give us a sense as to your visibility into things improving here for the back half of the year and how that uh, key profit driver is going to improve and allow you to meet that uh, group level profit guidance? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. And um, yeah. That's correct that, that we have, um, I would say, two biggest deltas. Uh, the agreement that you mentioned, um, legacy agreement from 2014, that was recognized 
in the end of last year. And, and of course, the, the two big ones, which are in, in litigation and renewal. And uh, just like Pekka showed in, in the, uh, his slide, we have some agreements with smartphone vendors that are no longer active or the one, ones that have lost market share. Um, and, um, and, and then this will be reflected uh, as we go through the renewal cycle as well. But we believe that the underlying fundamentals uh, remains strong. And, and I, I would say that the Samsung deal that we made is a good example of that. And that's why we are confident that our, our portfolio is very strong and, and, and we will get back to the annual run rate of uh, 1.4 to 1.5 billion net sales after we have concluded these current licensee renewal cycles. Can I add, uh, uh, Andrew, just one point to reinforce uh, the the importance of uh, of the Samsung renewal? We, of course, when we when we created this plan to get to this 1.4 to 1.5 billion run rate, we had uh, made certain assumptions as to what deals that run rate would consist of. Uh, would then uh, value uh, allocated to it and. Uh, I'm happy to confirm that the Samsung deal uh, is in that ballpark where uh, it is expected to be. So uh, that is an important part of this 1.4 to 1.5 billion strategy. Did you have a follow-up, Andrew? No, thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. We'll now take our next question from Alex Duval from Goldman Sachs. Alex, please go ahead. Yes, many thanks for the question. I wanted to focus on network, uh, network infrastructure, where you had another very strong quarter in the context of some peers actually uh, talking about weakness. So I wondered if you could explain the delta there and how sustainable is the momentum for the balance of this year and perhaps even into uh, 2024. I think you did state that some of the catch up uh, from supply constraints will fade in some of the areas. So to what extent do you think underlying strength will continue? Many thanks. Yes, thanks, Alex. Uh, and, and of course, as we have discussed many times, the, 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 the fundamental thing that is, uh, that is uh, driving all this that we are seeing in network infrastructure is the technology investment that we have made and the incredible strength of the portfolio as we are seeing in IP networks in, uh, in fixed uh, broadband. Now, perhaps a bit more lately, also in optical networks and of course in submarine networks. So that is the fundamental driver that is helping us to take market share, and that definitely continues to be our goal also going forward. Now, we have seen two and a half years of excellent execution from network infrastructure, and of course, this uh, Q1 uh, is a fantastic testimony of, uh, of the strength of the portfolio. Uh, just a little bit of caution uh, here, because uh, there was uh, some strong ordering last year because of worries that people had regarding supply chain uh, capabilities and so on, chipset, uh, uh, semiconductor, supply chain problems, uh, et cetera. Uh, and there is some catch-up deliveries and catch-up sales uh, now in this. And, and that is the reason why we are just saying that, that uh, even though our position is strong, it continues to be strong, uh, we need to be a little bit careful that you don't just extrapolate from Q1 to the, towards the rest, uh, rest of the year. Of course, uh, also in this business, we have a lot of customers who are currently thinking that uh, when should they invest, how much should they invest. The economic uncertainty is showing also in this, uh, this business. So just a little bit of caution uh, while, of course, the, uh, the overall picture in this business continues to be extremely positive. Thank you, Alex. Did you thank you very much. Uh, All good. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. We'll take our next question from Daniel Gerberg from Handelsbanken. Daniel, uh, Thank you very much, David, and um, good morning. Yeah, uh, my question would be, Elizabeth, uh, if you could give an uh, update on the competitive landscape. Uh, we heard a little bit of rumors from Samsung taking share in uh, perhaps in, in the U.S. and also an update on uh, the European landscape would be great with regards to Huawei, etc. Thank you. The, uh, well, first of all, we do not comment any any rumors. We have a we have a strong position in the U.S. and actually, actually, after 
some of the decisions that customers made in 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 mid 2020, which led to a lower market share for us. We have not uh, lost any market share uh, in mobile networks in North America. Actually, we have regained. We have taken back some market share with some of the tier two, tier three uh, suppliers, and um, our relationship with also <clears throat> also T-Mobile uh, is extremely strong. We are we are clearly one of the key suppliers, and we have a long term. 5G agreement uh, uh, with them. Then um, the other part of the question, I, I uh, you broke up a little bit, but uh, did I understand correctly that you asked about Huawei and uh, swaps and, and 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 so on? Yeah, yeah, correct in European markets uh, mostly. Yeah, okay, European markets. So as Marco said, uh, we are we are growing in mobile networks in uh, Europe. We had double digit growth uh, there uh, there uh, overall. If you exclude Nokia technologies from the figures, as you should. We had uh, 13% growth in Europe uh, in Q1, uh, which was across the board, including in mobile uh, networks. So we are clearly taking market share in Europe at the moment. And uh, and the big picture uh, when it comes to uh, uh, Huawei swaps continues to be roughly the same as we have said before, that we have uh, taken about 50% of those uh, opportunities. Thanks, Daniel. Perfect. We'll take a question from Simon Leopold from Raymond James. Simon, please. Great. Thank you for taking the question. Um, I, I appreciate you're not explicitly guiding for the, the June quarter, and, and you remain, uh, I think, upbeat, uh, relatively speaking, on the full year. But given what we're hearing about uh, inventory activity at the operators, uh, and, and I think you've alluded to this, but if we could get a little insight on how you're thinking about uh, the absorption of, of capacity by carriers uh, in the June quarter uh, and, and how to think about what you really mean by uh, not exactly seasonal. And, and then I've got a quick follow-up. Okay. If, if, if I start, then Marco, feel, feel, feel to, feel to add, 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 add if there's an transmission. But this whole inventory uh, question. Uh, first of all, uh, when we look at the big picture, this has been pretty much a, a, a North American uh, story uh, and very much a mobile network story. So we are talking about mobile networks in North, uh, North America. Uh, we do believe that, uh, that mobile networks uh, second quarter will see similar trends as uh, the first uh, uh, quarter. But uh, then again, since we are maintaining our full year assumption at uh, 7 to 10 percent uh, um, comparable operating margin, there you see that we are expecting a recovery then during uh, the second um, half uh, of the year. But again, this is a mobile network story. We are not seeing similar trends in the other businesses. Thanks. And, and just as the, the follow up, uh, you, you continue to sound, I think, uh, somewhat more upbeat on mobility than some of your peers, as well as some of the market research. And I know we, we talked about this at, at Mobile World Congress, but I, I'd like to sort of revisit um, how you're thinking about your business for the full year and beyond in terms of this idea that, uh, you know, we peaked and this is a, a, a difficult year. Um, could you maybe unpack a little bit about sort of the Nokia specific views on mobility trends? I think the the difference between what we are saying that what uh, both market analysts and and to some extent some of our competitors are saying I mean the difference could be the pace of deployment in India uh, the North American view is pretty similar I can't see any any kind of big differences there whether you compare us to what our competitors are saying or or what market analysts are, are saying we are seeing similar similar trends, including the fact that uh, that these issues will continue in the second quarter. Uh, but then, uh, especially comparing us to, for example, Del Oro, uh, we seem to be more uh, bullish on the size of the India market this year. And we believe that this pretty much explains the difference between our, our estimates and what they are saying. Thanks for that. Thanks, Simon. Um, we'll take our next question from Alexander Peterk from Societe Generale. Alex, please go. Yes, good morning, and, and thank you for taking the question. Uh, um, I would have just two questions. The first one would be on 
functionality in the phasing of small network margins that you cited for this year. Could you help us understand what will be the key drivers for the better growth margin in the second half? Is it a function of better geographic mix with North America recovering, or is it a lower contribution from low margin network rollouts in India? And then have a follow up. Well, first of all, the the Indian rollout will will continue. So that uh, that will be a story that you will see throughout uh, the year. Uh, clearly, the biggest needle mover compared to H1 and H2, uh, which is driving the seven to ten percent full year forecast, is North America. We do expect, as I said earlier, North American volumes to uh, recover in H2. Just to add, uh, like I said, uh, the we said earlier as well that we believe that the volume will give us um, leverage on, on the um, cost side, and, and uh, that's why we focus on the operating margin and not on cross margins. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. And as a follow-up, please, um, on uh, network infrastructure, so we understand there was a catch-up related to the easing of supply chain constraints. Would you be able in any way to quantify this for us or maybe indicate if we should see a much lower than usual seasonality in the second quarter versus first? I know you don't quite guide the quarters, but um, it will be quite important to know if, if NI is going to go down in, in revenue terms in Q2 versus Q1. Thank you. No, we are, I actually finally answered this question uh, already uh, already earlier, but but I'm not going to go into into details uh, when it comes to second quarter, we made an, we made an exception when it comes to mobile networks because we clearly see similar trends there as in uh, in Q1. Uh, without repeating what I said about NI earlier, we maintain the full year 11 to 14 percent uh, for the reasons uh, that I that I described. There was some catch up uh, in uh, uh, catch up sales in Q1. There is. Uh, some general uncertainty uh, on the uh, on the market, and uh, that uh, leads us to maintain the full year 11 to 14 percent. Thanks, Alex. Very clear. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Francois Bouvier from UBS. Francois, please go ahead. Hi, thank you uh, very much. Uh, so my question is more, um, you mentioned the trend in 2023 and the H2 recovery. Um, dynamics with the U.S. maybe coming back, and you know India still strong. If I remember, if I interpret correctly, so the margin should get get better. If we look a bit beyond, I mean, uh, you know, 2024 specifically, when you look at, you know, the U.S. Um, capex, you know, comments still uh, subdued. I would say, I mean, uh, just by looking at public comments from Verizon, so we are looking not, you know, big recovery. Um, you know, in, in the U.S. at least for 2024, India, given the strong, you know, year, strong rollout uh, pace, I mean, we can also argue the sustainability into 2024. So maybe can you help us quantify or maybe qualitatively give us some drivers into into next year? I mean, do you still expect to grow your, your end market after the dynamic of this year? That would be uh, very helpful. Mm. Of course, in mobile networks, as I said, uh, the fundamental driver, driver uh, as we see it in 5G is, is that uh, how big part of the networks have been upgraded to things like mid-band capacity, which is really the thing that is driving the uh, data capacity in the network, because the data traffic will continue to grow. We are not seeing that slowing down despite of the economic uncertainty. So the big picture remains healthy. The operators will have to continue to invest if they want to stay competitive. Uh, right now, there is some hesitation because of the economic uncertainty, because higher interest rates, and then also some of the supply chain normalization, which means that some of the inventories that they have built, they are, are coming to a conclusion that they will not need uh, them uh, anymore. But uh, the fundamentals in this business, we do believe, remain healthy. Then, of course, Every operator needs to make their own public comments about their CapEx, and you will have seen what the Americans have said about 2024 CapEx. Again, as I said earlier, only 50 percent of the North American 5G sites are currently uh, have been upgraded to mid-band, so there's a lot of work to do there uh, as well. 
I'm not going to get into into uh, 24 guidance uh, today. What we said in the progress update after Q4 4 obviously remains that uh, that our very clear ambition is to drive mobile networks into double-digit profitability. Thank, thank you. And and maybe yeah. you know, my follow-up um, would be on uh, on Europe uh, specifically uh, and your market share there um, with Huawei um, getting uh, you know into um, maybe. Um, uh, remove from part of the network, accelerating in some regions um, like Germany potentially. Or, or how is your market share now? I mean, what is your market share in Europe today, and and uh, what is your market share in in the deals you sign? I mean, do you see uh, a strong drivers, or is it like visible really in, in your PNL this dynamic, and and how long it will last would be would be great. Thank you. Do you have Marco the market yeah, share? Yeah, we what comes to 40, 50 market share. So we believe that in Europe we are around 29, 30 percent somewhere there. And and just like we said earlier, on those uh, deals where customers have uh, changed the vendor base, we have won about half of those. Uh, so we believe we have. A very good position, and just a, you, you saw as well in quarter one, we continue to grow in Europe um, again in mobile network side uh, with a very good growth rate, and um, and this is evidence that we are taking market share in Europe as well. When, when you take, if you take Del Oro figures in in, in Europe, which uh, which we do not believe that would be far from the truth, uh, they are saying for the this is at the end of 22. Uh, 29.2 uh, percent, and that is 2.9 percentage points incre increase in one year. So in mobile networks, we now have uh, four to five quarters behind us, where we have taken market share globally outside of China. So this is a strong proof point of of the the return on investment that we are getting on the R&D, and of course, of course, the the uh, latest product, which further increases our competitiveness, which is the Havrock generation that we launched in Mobile World Congress that has not even started uh, to deliver yet. Right. Thank you very much. Excellent. So we'll take our next question from Joseph Zhu from Redburn. Joseph, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for taking my questions. I have two. I will go one at a time. And firstly, just on your network infrastructure business, which had a very strong margin again this quarter, um, but with the lower margin optical business grew the strongest. And how should we understand the, the very strong year-on-year -year margin uh, progression this quarter, given the I would argue the slightly unfavorable uh, mix um, uh, for, for that division? Which business within uh, and I had the strongest improvement in, in margin? Well, first of all, because we now have great top-line growth in uh, in uh, uh, IP networks, 13% constant currency growth, and because that business has the best profitability uh, in that business group, of course, that such drive the margin. So that's uh, the mix between businesses inside NI. But I also would like to like to highlight optical networks because there is, as in all these businesses, there is a heavy uh, R&D cost, and then there is SG&A as well. So uh, when you have, uh, like in this quarter, 45% growth, uh, that delivers a pretty healthy operating uh, margin leverage uh, as well. So those would be the two things that I would highlight as drivers for the NI, behind the NI margin. You Thank you. Uh, yes, my, my follow-up is we have seen a quite a significant decoupling of growth trajectory between wireless and wired networks equipment spend in North America. And would you attribute this more to the high inventory level related to 5G or simply operators is shifting capex towards wired following the, the big 5G rollouts in North America? Obviously, I think it's probably both, but, but would you uh, attribute this more to customer destocking? Yeah, the, 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 the latter one is something that actually operators should, uh, should comment. But we are, we are seeing, seeing, as we commented in the report, we saw uh, 
strong development in in network infrastructure in North America at the same time when we saw weakness uh, in mobile networks. And again, that mobile network's weakness, uh, in a way, is a double whammy that you have both slightly lower, uh, slower uh, construction uh, pace, and then you have inventory depletion. So it's a combination of the two. But, uh, but right now, we are not seeing this uh, in the same way in NI. Thank you, Joseph. We'll take our next Thank you. question. Stefan Slowinski from BNP Parba. Um, Stefan, please go ahead. Uh, great, thanks, uh, David. And hello, Becca and Marco. Um, just wanted to get a clarification on the comment during the prepared remarks around the net cash uh, longer term uh, only required to be 15% of sales. Did you say that it was after 2024 um, that you would look to put that into place? Um, and I think you said you could do that either through substantial M&A or buyback. So just kind of wondering how you would decide between the two. Um, and if it was more substantial M&A, you know, what areas you might be considering for that. So that would be my, my first question. And just a quick follow-up is um, considering some of the early signs we're seeing about a broadening weaker macro environment, just wondering if there's any more cost-cutting initiatives that you, you're taking or, or could take uh, in order to ensure that margins are preserved going into next year. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Stefan. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the capital management um, policy, I would say that uh, first of all, we want to sustain and, and, and secure that we have a solid overall financial position. Uh, and uh, when it comes to timing of uh, reaching the target, we've said that we don't take any immediate um, actions due to the fact that that we see a growth uh, in 2023, which uh, is tidying up more working capital. At the same time, there's macroeconomic uncertainties as well. And, and that's why uh, we said that we will look into that, uh, look into taking actions in 2024, where we expect that cash generation will improve. Uh, what comes to uh, our M&A activities, um, we we have said both on acquisitions could be one uh, way, and or. Uh, more returns to shareholders. We haven't specified more than that. And what comes to M&A in general, we don't have any plans to make any any big uh, uh, acquisitions. It's more targeted to secure our technology leadership and and offering towards our customers uh, and and looking those kind of acquisitions. And then then just to follow up. I mean, of course, you should not forget that we just increased our dividend from uh, from. Two cents to three cents per quarter. That's a 50 percent increase, and then we are continuing into the second uh, 300 million year uh, of this 600 million buyback program. So we are we are returning uh, returning. And remember this uh, uh, free cash flow conversion guidance of 20 to 50 percent of uh, of net sales uh, this year is something that we need to keep in mind as well. Thank you, Stefan. We'll take our next question from Richard. Oh, sorry. Um, we didn't answer the question restructuring. Uh, uh, sorry, what was the other Whether question? You, Stefan, I guess if you want to repeat a bit, if I recall, it was. Um, uh, of course, yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, yeah, sorry. Any cost cutting, any cost -cutting initiatives um, either underway or, or could be planned if the macro environment does continue to weaken throughout the year to preserve margins for next year? Thank you. First of all, we still we still have this uh, 600 million program uh, ongoing that we said that would continue until the end of 2023. So it means that we are continuously trimming the cost base. So this is even without any new announcements or anything like that. This is something that we do all the time, and the businesses have full responsibility for keeping their cost base in in shape. And of course. The businesses and we in group management, we are paying a lot of attention to the macro environment, and we are we are adjusting uh, the cost management uh, uh, accordingly. We are not making any new announcements uh, today on this one, but uh, I just want to want to highlight that uh, that uh, this does not mean that there would not be actions ongoing all the time. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. We'll take Next question from Richard Kramer from Aretha. Richard, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, guys. Good morning. Um, Pekka, can you 
uh, give us a little bit more visibility or update uh, us on the sustainability of that growth rate in enterprise given the new customer wins. Um, we've seen that have fits and starts in the past uh, where you had a very good growth rate one quarter and then it, it tailed off the quarter after. And maybe can you give us a bit more detail of, uh, you mentioned web scale uh, and hyperscalers. Can you give us a sense of what an imp what portion of that enterprise business is now focused on the very large hyperscalers versus the long tail of private wireless and enterprise customers? And then I'll have a quick follow-up. Thanks. It is the, the web scale part. Uh, we are not disclosing it in, in uh, monetary terms, but what I can say is that it is still a uh, fairly small part of the overall uh, enterprise business, which obviously was the total enterprise 2 billion euro last year. Um, am I going to promise that the 62% growth rate will, will, will <laughs> <sustain>? <laughs> but, uh, but remember Q4 was 40, what was it? 49%, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we have, and, and Q3 was, uh, was it over 20%? Yeah, 20 something percent. So we start to have some track record uh, on this. And, uh, and, and of course, this is important because and, 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 and we said that we will have a, 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 a strong uh, double digit uh, full year uh, growth uh, this year. But again, there could be jumps up and down also in individual quarters, because some of the deliveries can also have some bulkiness because there is, uh, remember, in addition to the web scale deals and campus uh, networks. Uh, there is also wide area private networks uh, in that mix uh, for authorities, uh, uh, for example, for uh, for utilities and so on. So you could see some lumpiness, but the general direction is good. We have a strong uh, pipeline uh, of new opportunities. And uh, of course, the difference between this customer segment and the CSP segment is that here it's really up to us and take it. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of potential customers, where, whereas on the CSP side, uh, we are fairly dependent on a small number of customers. And then a quick follow-up for Marco, uh, very helpful slide, number 11, with the, the bridge of uh, Nokia Technologies. But with such a huge amount sitting in these uh, smartphone agreement renewals, can you just help us understand how you're handling the costs of all that litigation uh, against those renewals right now? Are those costs being taken through the P&L today, or are they being put off until uh, an agreement is reached and, and that might have a big impact on profitability when, when, when you finally are able to reach terms? Yeah, thank you. Yes, we, we take litigation costs in our P&L immediately. Uh, and and um, now, of course, when we have these two litigations, you see a little bit more litigation costs. But of course, we have other costs in the technologies, OPEX as well, as we have R&D, uh, different patent portfolio costs, different development and, and other um, uh, licensing related expenses that we have there. But we, we always take those immediately in our P&L. Okay, thanks guys. We'll take our next question from Sebastian Stabovitz from Kepler Shivra. Sebastian, please go ahead. Yeah, hello, and thanks for taking my question. Uh, one follow-up on one question previously on the uh, market growth or market outlook uh, for 2024. You answered on a mobile network, but what is your view on the market trends for NI and the different business within NI and then also on CNS? How do you see the demand uh, developing beyond 2023? And a second question would be on this uh, patent litigation with the uh, Chinese smartphone OEM. Could you please make an update and tell us a little bit uh, where your litigation are standing right now? Have you made any kind of progress? How the situation is evolving on these specific litigations? Thank you. Okay, if I take the first one and Marco takes the second one. So NI uh, market uh, growth rates, uh, we actually actually gave uh, some estimations in connection with the Q4 uh, progress uh, uh, update. Uh, IP networks, Kager, 3% uh, fixed networks, Kager, 4% and optical networks, Kager, 2%. So th those, these would be the overall market growth rates. We have not uh, looked into specifically 2024 at this time. Uh, these are kind of uh, 
longer term growth, underlying growth rates. Uh, of course, uh, uh, what means longer term in this, this case, 2022, 25, that's what we said in January for the next three uh, years, CAGR at constant currency. That's what we are looking at at the moment. But of course, this is something that uh, we are following up all the time, depending on how the general economy develops from here. Yeah, and what comes to litigations on those two cases, I suppose you are referring to, uh, we have um, uh, uh, continuous um, wins also in different um, jurisdictions. The latest one came from uh, Germany, where we had a, a positive outcome from uh, uh, against Vivo. And then what comes to Oppo, I think the latest one came from UK, uh, where uh, the court ruled uh, in our favor there as well. And uh, what comes to court in Brazil, they also granted us a preliminary injunction there. So we, step by step, we are proceeding here, what comes to the litigation uh, proceedings. And, but at the same time, of course, we continue to negotiate with both parties uh, to find um, suitable solution um, but as we said before, we are not uh, targeting any specific timeline here. We want to uh, defend the value of our portfolio because we believe that we have a very good portfolio and, uh, and we are um, following those international rules when it comes to friend uh, in these as well. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, we'll take Thank our you. next question. Sami Sarkimis from Danske Bank. Sami, please go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, can you please talk about uh, developments at uh, CNS in Q1? You did flag a uh, weak mix with higher hardware sales. Is this temporary in nature? And uh, is it related to 5G core or the enterprise business? Um, and then maybe as a follow-up, uh, what is the margin impact from uh, strong enterprise growth uh, during the past few quarters on CNS? Okay, thank you, Sami. Um, first of all, um, I would say that that the, the margin shift that we had in, in quarter one is not due to the enterprise uh, sales. It is purely, um, uh, I would say, uh, mixed between software and hardware. And, and in quarter one, we had larger share of hardware shipments uh, than we normally have. and, and um, and a little bit lower software, so this was uh, the reason. And um, we expect the mix having a little bit headwind in quarter two as well. But remember also this is software type of business, so, so normal seasonality is that, that um, uh, most of the profit is always coming towards the end of the year. And, um, and this is exactly what we expect here as well, and, and that's why we have the full year guidance and, and we, we uh, reiterated that again as well, that, that uh, what comes to our uh, guidance assumptions, specifically for CNS, uh, we assume to have 5.5 uh, to 8.5% operating margin for the full year. Thank okay, you, thanks. We'll take our last question from Sandeep Deshpande from JP Morgan. Sandeep, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for letting me on. Uh, my question is, uh, sorry, I don't know whether this was asked before, but is the weakness, I mean, you've seen two consecutive quarters in which your gross margin has been impacted in mobile networks. Uh, I mean, you talked just now about software hardware mix uh, is this what is going to change into the second half of the year which will improve the margin in mobile networks uh, because geographically the mix has changed and that is probably not going to change into the second half of the year well uh, the the reason for the gross margin drop is specifically the geographical mix and uh, that was actually actually there already in q4 uh, last year so we now have q uh, sorry, two quarters of uh, of weaker volumes in North America and mobile networks, and that is expected to continue, as I said earlier, uh, through the second quarter. And then we are expecting a recovery uh, in the second half of the year, which then explains why we are maintaining the seven to ten percent full year uh, operating margin guidance for mobile networks. 
So the improvement in mobile networks, uh, Pekka, in the second half will occur because, again, geographical mix shift rather than uh, some uh, adjustment associated with, uh, with software hardware as such, really. That is, that is correct. This is not the software hardware uh, question. This is, uh, this is a geographical mix, or I should say specifically North American volume uh, question, where we expect recovery in the second half of the year. And the software hardware that was on the CNS cloud yeah. network. Understood. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, indeed. And thank you, everyone, for joining us um, today. This does conclude today's call. I would like to remind you that during the call today, we have made a number of forward-looking statements that involve risks and uncertainties. Actual results may therefore differ materially from the results currently expected. Factors that could cause such differences can be both external as well as internal operating factors. We have identified such risks in the risk factor section of our annual report on Form 20F, which is available on the Investor Relations website. Thank you for joining us.